Well, thank you for the invitation. I'm delighted to come to give a talk for in honor of Swan Pierre Dimani, who I admire very much. I've known about his work since 30 years ago, and uh, I learned a lot from studying his papers on Kayla Kong's holomorphic models in Nicole and many other important works. So uh, I feel honored to come here, although it's a long way for me, actually. <laughs> and, uh, um, but um, I'm also very happy that he come to China in the last few years to help out. and has been extremely helpful for us. So today, my talk is on complete Kala symmetric. I suddenly remember this is the same title I gave 40 years ago. <laughs> so, so it's about uh, existence of Kala symmetric when we just uh, finished the proof in 1976. Um, so, this is the year I did uh, the work with Cheng uh, on complete Kala symmetric on non compact manifolds. And the ideas are still uh, being used here. And um, this work I'm talking is a drawn work with uh, my former student, Da Ming Wu, uh, WU, from uh, University of Connecticut. So let me just start out from a simple thing that everybody knows. Nonetheless, I talk about it. So I'm going to talk about uh, uh, holomorphic sessional curvature. And the Liu Wu theorem always comes into play. And the point getting metric is the metric, as we know, has constant negative curvature. And uh, now, to, we, we are interested in high-dimensional generalization of a Poincaré metric. And naturally, we will look at into holomorphic n forms, which is given by here. And the question is, k, the canonical bundle, has global sessions or not in general. And it could be uh, no sessions, but the power of it could have more sessions. So uh, for Kala symmetric, uh, with negative scalar curvature is directly related to the statement where k is positive or not, whether k is ample or not. Because that's uh, part of the major uh, uh, result in those years due to Obama and myself in this case, is that it makes a Kala symmetric with negative scalar curvature for a compact Kala manifold. First trend class negative, even only if it admits a Kala symmetric with negative scalar curvature. And this is an important statement because it gives you a canonical description, because this guy is unique, of such a manifold by using metric geometry. Um, there, uh, this class of metric is much more well understood compared with the case when the, cur when the scalar curvature is equal to zero or positive. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, uh, there are much bigger class of manifolds which admit such metric. Uh, for many years now, it's uh, 40 years as I said, uh, there are many more developments, but actually the major questions as far as I can, uh, I'm concerned are not solved, uh, left over in this uh, class of manifolds. Uh, namely, we've got to understand the singularity that are created um, uh, out of uh, singularity of the manifold itself. Especially when the manifold has a uh, singularity uh, given by complex geometry only, we like to understand what kind of singularity the Kalan symmetric has. And these are extremely important to apply metric uh, um, uh, geometry to understand complex geometry. That has been always the major goal for me, to how to use metric to understand complex geometry. And in order to do it, we have to understand singularity of the manifold. I mean, of the metric coming uh, from the geometry. So already, uh, when I was a graduate student already, I was interested in this problem. Uh, so uh, you kind of folklore, there's a question of Kobayashi's hyperbolic, whether it implies the manifold has a uh, general type or, or negative first chain class or not. Uh, this was naturally asked because uh, hyperbolic in terms of kind of in terms of length, and this one in terms of volume. So length should be stronger than volume, and that's why this is conjecture. But I was more interested in this much more s a specific case where holomorphic sessional curvature is negative. Because this was the major reason why uh, hyperbolic metric was studied at the very beginning. Hyperbolic, Kobayashi hyperbolic was studied uh, through the Schwarzlemmer. That negative holomorphic sessional curvature implies 
uh, manifold to be Kobayashi hyperbolic. So I thought maybe we just study this part, which is, uh, should be uh, interesting enough. And this has been <coughs> a useful thing. And, uh, and uh, there's a, a Conrad's question, of course, you can ask. This was, uh, there's an example due to Sampier, which says that it's not true. And, um, but nevertheless, we still like to understand this. Um, so just let me explain a bit about the history in case. Um, I actually, I'm not quite expert on history. The most of the history here are uh, told to me by, by uh, Darming Wu. Uh, so if, in case I miss out some, some of the description of history, uh, you should probably should remind me. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so, um, so what happens is that uh, several authors have studied this in, in complex dominant too. And uh, they answer affirmatively in this case by Ban Wang and Campania. And also, um, then there's also the uh, John Well of uh, quite a few people here, three people, uh, HLW, using standard algebraic geometry uh, argument, and uh, you know, this hot index theorem. And so they're good. And um, also um, uh, the Bishop Goldberg theorem. So they, they um, <coughs> look into this, but in high dimension, it becomes more difficult because the classification theory is not so powerful anymore. Uh, so one still needs to uh, uh, have some uh, uh, important um, uh, contribution due to Peter Nell for projective free thought. Um, and also, uh, much later now, uh, as a testing case, uh, uh, Pitman Wong, who passed away, unfortunately, and Darwin Wu and myself, uh, several years ago, looked at this for projective manifold with Picard number equal to 1. So that makes life easier because uh, then the, the, the um, light bundle can be much easier to understand. Uh, so there we assume holomorphic character to be quasi-negative. So non-positive everywhere and negative at one point. So that was an assumption we made and we proved that statement. And uh, <coughs> so then uh, free thought was solved by this free offers again uh, using the abundance conjecture in algebraic geometry. Of course, uh, abundance conjecture is still a major part of questions and not an easy thing to do at all. So um, one needs to try to bypass the abundance conjecture. Uh, although it's known to be true for low dimension, um, so uh, they proved that um, if the manifold has negative holomorphism curvature, then the canonical light bundle is numerical effective. And the numerical effective, uh, effective dimension is equal to the dimension of the manifold itself. So that's what they did. And then, <coughs> then they, they make use of abundance conjecture to finish the proof, uh, assuming <coughs> uh, be because the abundance conjecture says that uh, for manifold, it implies that if the manifold with numerical effective canonical light bundle, the Kodaria dimension is equal to the numerical effective dimension. So this, in particular, implies that the Kodaria dimension is equal to the dimension of the manifold itself, which means it's general time. So, uh, so that's good, but that's making assumption of abundance conjecture. So. About a few years ago, um, Darwin will come to Harvard and we talk about it again. So we uh, solved the problem um, in the statement uh, uh, that I mentioned earlier and removed the assumption of the abundance of conjecture. Um, so we have different approaches and uh, these approaches was followed by some other people which I will discuss a little bit later. Uh, so the major statement, uh, the first statement we proved in about two years ago, was that if we admit a Kähler metric with negative holomorphism character, then K is ample. So that was the major statement I conjectured many years ago. Um, now negative holomorphism character is actually um, a rather interesting uh, uh, statement. Um, you you don't need uh, where. Uh, smooth uh, um, assumption on the metric to describe negative holomorphic curvature. Because um, 
if you take any uh, curve sitting in a manifold, the induced metric would have negative holomorphic and curvature. So what the smoothness assumption is just that for any metric uh, on the ambient manifold induced on the curve should have negative holomorphic and curvature, less than or equal to minus one, for example. And so you only need smoothness assumption on all the curves. And, and that is, that is uh, easy to describe. And in that form, uh, I'm not sure this, uh, this proof can be carried out, uh, actually. Uh, all that would be interesting to know. So here, I'm assuming I have a smooth k metric with such a condition. But as I said, the smoothness assumption can be removed, and you can generalize the, 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 the concept of negative holomorphic holomorph curvature to very non-smooth uh, metrics. <coughs> Uh, so, the, because every smooth of variety, uh, <coughs> smooth or not smooth actually, especially with a curve, sitting there should have a negative holomorphic and curvature. So, there are many rooms for you to, uh, to generalize this statement as a result, because the concept of negative holomorphic and curvature can be um, generalized to a more general situation. And even in terms of algebraic geometry, then I think it would be interesting to also understand what that means. Because you can go to the projective uh, tangent bundle and define homomorphic and curvature in terms of the uh, first trend cast or tautological line bundle there. And you want some, in some part of it is negative or positive, depends how you define it, to, to get the understanding of what this means. And we, with that kind of assumption, I don't know how to prove this statement. Uh, in a more general setting. Okay. So there are many rooms that you can improve. Um, so there are several proofs we propose. One is to try to prove the, the, the <coughs> canon Ribbon is big in this sense, that its top dimension integral is strictly positive. Um, this is really uh, rather easy because uh, uh, um, hyperbolicity uh, because holomorphic and curves are negative, implies M has no rational curves. And so using Morris theory, you know the canon Ribbon is negative, it's numerical effective, and this being big, then one can prove uh, with uh, <coughs> uh, the negative uh, first trend class using all these arguments due to many people, Dimaye and many other people. Um, but then uh, a more important step is uh, that we introduce, we go back to the original uh, theory that uh, I had using Mohn's ampere equation to construct k metric with, uh, <coughs> where rich curvature is a low bound. Uh, this is um, much better because not only that you can prove that the first train class of the manifold is negative, you actually have some idea of how the k metric looks like. And uh, these, these are useful, and I would uh, <coughs> talk about it. So this one used uh, some Swartz lemma uh, argument, uh, which I studied quite extensively all the way since I was a graduate student, and many of my papers actually depends on understanding the Swartz lemma in the right way. Um, so, so we we try to uh, give uh, using Swartz lemma in the arguments or the Monson pair equation. To, to, to see how to construct uh, a sequence of metric converges to the k lines metric, which implies uh, canon line bundle is positive because existence of k lines metric uh, naturally implies first trend class is negative. So the argument was immediately followed by several people, and, uh, including Tusati and Yang, and, uh, <coughs> and then <coughs> At the beginning, we assume the manifold is projective uh, and all that, but that, that can be done easily uh, as observed by many people to be, one just need to assume to be Kayla. But I think Kayla is probably do not need to also could be generalized more. Um, now then the question is to generalize the case to the, uh, to the case when H is quasar negative. So that means if the holomorphic and curvature is negative at one point and non-positive everywhere. Uh, so uh, this was <coughs> established independently uh, recently by two groups of people here. 
and uh, using a Monsen pair type equation and the refine Schwarz lemma. Um, so here, one uh, has different type of argument. So Devero and Trapani use the pluripotential theory, where we use some elementary lemma, uh, which was uh, done by Chen and myself uh, in early 1970s. Uh, so, uh, questions about um, uh, positive uh, super harmonic functions uh, that we developed in 1970s. So this allows you to prove convergence, so, which I will talk a little bit later. Uh, so one can also use this one to prove uh, uh, the ampleness of canal libido uh, use, uh, assuming cartetonic hyperbolicity. And this is much easier, of course, but on the other hand, this falls from the Schwarz lemma. Uh, so this is uh, uh, not Kobayashi hyperbolic, stronger than Kobayashi hyperbolic, because uh, you get a lot of bound holomorphic function on the universal cover of the, the manifold. Um, so you map the universal cover to unities so that the map, holomorphic map, uh, maps uh, the, the tangent matter to a vector at the origin and you maximize the point grade length of the image. That's what is called Cartier-Dorian pseudo-metric. And this, we can apply the uh, schwarz lemma to prove that you have the same thing, that you get a complete Taylor answer metric in that way. OK, so let me go to uh, give the proof um, in more concrete terms now. So. Um, these are holomorphic of curvature of the Kähler metric, so you get a Kähler manifold, and <coughs> we want to prove this, so I will talk about it. This is a statement I just uh, mentioned, uh, that H is everywhere negative, then K is positive, and non-positive non only is numerical effective. If it's quasi-negative, uh, quasi it's also enough to imply canal I window to be positive. Uh, as I said, there's an algebraic geometric version of statements which I think uh, would be nice to prove. So the algebraic geometric statement is similar to, uh, to it should be implied by um, the tangent bundle to be uh, negative. Uh, so uh, <coughs> there of course it's easier if we assume the whole tangent bundle is negative. We are only assuming some small part of the tangent bundle is negative. It should implies that. Okay, so how does the setting go? So we construct the following thing. We take a Kähler metric, where it has negative holomorphic sensorial character. So this is an assumption given to you. And this is the first trend form, which is the rigid form of this metric. <coughs> so th th this is the first trend class of the canal bundle, not necessarily. Um, have a side because that's exactly what we want to prove. But <coughs> we make this assumption um, that um, the background omega has negative holomorphic sensor character. But nonetheless, we can define this equation, at least when t is very large. You see, this is a metric, and then I want to construct u to satisfy this equation. So this is an equation that defines a k and metric for u. This metric will be this one. It's always assumed to be strictly positive, so it's a Kähler metric. So when we compute the Kähler metric, omega t, when t goes zero, this becomes a Kähler Einstein metric by its uh, equation that you define. So when t goes zero, the rigid form of this metric will be equal to itself. So therefore, it will be k Einstein if t equals 0. Now we know this exists uh, when t is large, uh, because t omega dominates everything. And so we know this would be an equation that can be solvable when t is large. And then what the idea is to try to prove is that t can be solved, this equation can, equation can be solved for all t, up to t equals 0. And if we can do it, then we finish the proof. Okay? So that's how, how we look at the, the, the problem. 
So, um, so we start out from something non-empty, namely when t is very large. And then we want to show that uh, we can move t to small by doing some estimate. So first of all, we prove that the set of t so that this can be solved is um, a um, <coughs> open set. Okay. So this means you can deform this equation in a small. So when t can be, when t one solve this equation, then I want to say that when t is very close to t one, this equation can be solved also. So this means equation can be deformed in a small, and this can be done without much difficulty because. Uh, this is a well-studied um, equation. So, so this is the what I just said. Look at t belongs to the interval, so that this can be solved. And we know this this can be solved because t one belongs to this interval. And we want to show it's open. We just differentiate this equation by impli by implicit function theorem. So implicit function theorem uh, <coughs> tells you. If you look at the linearized equation of this, which is this uh, operator, if you can prove that this, this operator is invertible, then you can uh, prove that by implicit function theorem that this equation can be solved. And this is very standard, so you, can, you know how to do it. And the fact this is invertible is rather straightforward argument uh, in partial differential equations. So let's not put much effort into that. The important question is how to do it, how to prove uh, this set is closed. So the fact that this is open set follows from standard uh, deformation theory, um, linearized elliptic operators. And the difficulty, well not the difficulty, is, uh, the major point is to prove closeness, to say that uh, this set is closed. Once you prove it's open and closed, then the whole thing is the interval itself. So then t can be taken equal to zero. When t equals zero, that's the equation we want to solve. Okay. So this is a standard continuity argument. Okay. So now we do the computation, and the computation comes out from the following thing. We generalize the Schwarz lemma. Uh, I I studied Schwarz lemma for a long time, and. Uh, I generalize it to much more general uh, Kähler manifolds uh, than what Arthur did. And, uh, the, but then, immediately, uh, <coughs> Royden improved my argument slightly and was able to apply to holomorphic character. So I get to this form of the generalization. If the holomorphic character of omega 1 is here, uh, is the image manifold, actually, we look at it as. And the rich character of omega 2, the two Kähler metric here, omega 1 and omega 2. Suppose the rich character is bigger than or equal to lambda omega 2 plus mu omega 1. So lambda and mu are constants. So suppose the rich character has a lower bound of this sort. Then you look at, you compute the Laplacian of this uh, trace. Uh, take log and compute the trace. You get to this uh, right hand side. Uh, this is basically a straightforward calculation uh, that uh, one knows how to do uh, in the case of a uh, Schwarz lemma type argument. So, the important point here is that you get kappa, which is the whole more character here. So, kappa is positive because I assume kappa, uh, whole more sensitive character is strongly negative. So, this kappa positive is important here. And mu is also important here. Uh, uh, so I put it here, plus lambda. Now lambda is not too important. Lambda is actually negative here. Um, but the important part is the positivity in this, uh, in this term. So how do we uh, use of it? Uh, we use it for maximum principle. Uh, so basically, you look at this function. This is a function I want to calculate. Omega 2 uh, um, is a metric. Uh, that I'm trying to construct. So the way that we go is that omega 1 is given yeah, for our application. It's a given background metric where holomorphic character is strongly negative. Omega 2 is actually changing the metric. 
is the metric that I wrote down here. Is this metric. This is the metric which I will call omega 2. And this one, we can calculate the rich curvature and turns out to set to this inequality. So omega 2 is changing. Omega 1 is fixed. And I want to apply uh, this inequality to omega 2, the changing metric. Now, what's the use of this? All these are metrics, of course. And I apply maximum principle. What does the maximum principle tell you? At the maximum point where this guy is achieved, is maximum point, this one is non-positive. Maximum principle says that at the maximum point, the Laplace is non-positive. So on the right-hand side, this one is positive constant. This gives you an estimate of this fellow immediately. Because mass, uh, this one with the maximum of the, this function, which is the same function up to exponential. So therefore, this gives you an upper bound. So let, let's take a look at this estimate. Uh, so as I said, uh, the way it goes is that I take omega t to the power n equal to this. There was an equation. And I compute the rigid character of this equation. It's just take log of this one and take dd bar. That's why I get minus omega t plus t omega. Okay. So um, this is just dialect calculation, as I mentioned. Uh, so h omega, which I call omega 1 there, implies this. Okay. So omega 1 equal omega, and omega 2 equal omega t. That's what I just said. I get this inequality. The maximum principle implies this number at the maximum point is less than or equal to 1. So I get this estimate. Okay. So the estimate says that for all t, the trace of omega with respect to omega t has a universal bound, as long as kappa is positive. Okay. That's the case where the homomorphism curvature is less than or equal to a negative constant. Okay. Now what about this t? This t is non-negative, so we can throw it away if we want to. But we don't want to throw it away completely, because when t is strictly positive, this guy would be helpful. But when t equals 0, we still have this inequality. So now, the important point is that the trace of omega to the omega t is always has a universal bound. So now, um, so now, once we have this, um, we get a close, we get a, a estimate of this thing, and also it's a rather easy argument to prove using maximum principle, using for this thing to prove u has an upper bound. That's why scalar unsymmetric negative uh, scalar curvature is much easier because I can control the upper bound u by maximum principle without much effort. And so once we have this control that u can be controlled, and the trace of omega t omega has a bound, then we can control everything. Why? Because the superior u has an upper bound, means the determinant of the um, metric omega t, if you diagonalize omega t uh, uh, with respect to the background metric, there are some eigenvalues, lambda i. Determinant has upper bound, means lambda 1 times lambda n has an upper bound. And the boundness on the trace means 1 over lambda 1 plus 1 over lambda n has upper bound. So what that means is that this one has upper bound, and this one has upper bound, and lambda i are all positive. So these two inequality in trivially implies all the lambda i has upper bound and lower bound. Okay. So, uh, so this elementary, you can uh, prove it yourself. Um, so lambda i has upper bound and lower bound uh, by constant. And this tells you a remarkable fact, actually. Omega t has upper bound and lower bound. Now, the good thing is this. In this estimate, the only thing the c depends on are uh, only on the curvature, uh, holomorphism curvature. So this gives you a remarkable uh, description of the k-line symmetric. When t goes 0, this is a k-line symmetric. Omega 0 is a k-line symmetric. And this gives you a rather concrete effective estimate of the k lines symmetric. So whenever the manifold admits a k line metric with strongly negative homomorphism curvature, the k lines symmetric is bound distance from them. Uh, 
up to a constant depending on the curvature. Okay. Uh, this is a rather interesting fact which uh, we never had before. So we didn't really know exactly how the KR and symmetric look like. The previous argument that uh, we did before, we know how to estimate it, but it depends on many other quantities that we, we don't like to see. Uh, it involves bisexual curvature, it involves sober constant and all kinds. So here it's very clean. It just depends on the whole wall sensor curvature. Okay. So in particular, if you have a family of algebraic manifolds with uh, negative holomorphic sensor curvature, the K-lines are metric also deformed, uh, uh, equivalent in that, in that way. So um, if you want to understand uh, K-lines are metric, its deformation and all that, it would be useful you know how to describe a family of uh, uh, k metrics with negative holomorphic sensor curvature because it then controls this K-lines are metric. Is there any question? No. Okay. Now, um, high order estimate can be derived in many standard ways. Nowadays, I think people are just lazy. They want to just quote uh, Kirov or um, Evans and all that. But the, the original argument we use is just as simple and even uh, more conceptually better. You just do the, uh, the, 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 the trace of this fellow. Uh, the third order estimate, and you get simple equality. Uh, the only trouble is that people doesn't like to compute this, uh, big computation. Uh, but the com computing is rather straightforward, on the other hand. Uh, and and the, the, the conclusion is better, I think, e also. But anyway, so in this way, you get all the estimates that you want, second order, third order, up to all order. Uh, they can be controlled. So uh, there, I of course, uh, wrote down the equivalence of the, the metric uh, in this way, the equivalent to uh, k lines are metric in this form. But of course, the third order estimate uh, can be uh, um, depending more things. Uh, then you have to compute what this constant is carefully. And, uh, and this uh, may not be uh, the best. But if you know more about this, you can get high order estimate of the metric besides just the uh, the uniform equivalence, which I just wrote down. Okay. Okay. So, um, so now how about numerical uh, effective, without using any other things, just proof the, and and use the data based only on analysis. Well, the whole point is that you, uh, if you just assume holomorphic sensor curvature, non-positive, not necessarily strongly negative. In that case, we can use T that I, I wrote down earlier uh, because I throw away T because T is non no, non-negative. But, uh, but it's still useful. It says that when T is non-zero, you get this estimate. <coughs> so at least when T is strictly positive, uh, omega T can be controlled in this way, except when T2 goes to zero, this may blow up. Okay. But anyway, that gives you a control of omega t when t is not zero. So we know that omega t is, um, is uh, a Kähler uh, metric all the way until t becomes zero. And this already um, uh, gives rise to a, a way to, con to prove that the Kähler bundle is numerical effective. Okay. So it, it implies that holomorphic sensory curvature, non-positive, uh, Km is numerical effective. Um, <coughs> so um, now, uh, if numerical is effective, then you want to prove that uh, the is big. C1 to the power n is positive. And uh, well, you can, uh, we, we are trying to, to give another proof quasi-projective now. So non-positive and negative at one point. Now, you look at omega t to the power n, and you get to this inequality by expanding it when t goes to zero. So you just need to prove there exists a sequence tj so that the integral of it is strictly positive. In order to prove this one, you look at it carefully, you just need to bound the maximum of ut, because ut actually measures this volume form. Uh, you, would, you just need it to be strictly positive at one point. Uh, omega t to the power n. You don't need to be everywhere. You j because you only care about integral to be strictly positive. So you only need to prove that the maximum ut is bound away from minus infinity. 
It's, uh, it could not collapse, totally collapse. And that's, of course, just a description why this integral should be positive. So in order to do it, um, you, have, uh, uh, you can use the following lemma, which I did in 1974 with uh, S.Y. Chen, my friend uh, S.Y. Chen, when we were more or less a graduate student. Uh, so this statement says that this is, this is a statement true for generally many manifold. And um, so the cur you, you can scale the function to a function less than equal minus 1, and Laplacian has a lower bound. Then you can prove this uh, inequality, that um, log minus v, minus v makes sense because minus v is positive, and greater than v has a bound, depending on this. So this constant depending only on n, omega, and c naught. Okay? So independent of the equation, just depends on this. So this is a rather uh, simple argument, uh, which I did a uh, long time ago. Uh, but actually, uh, this is an argument where we push uh, non for non-compact manifold, where we have to uh, choose the cutoff function more carefully, uh, where we prove the same estimate, assuming the manifold has volume growth less than equal to R square. So that was the argument I used to prove that for general complete manifold, if the volume growth is less than or equal to R square, then they, it does not support any uh, bound uh, subharmonic function. Okay. So this, this argument uh, comes from there. Okay, so how do we apply? Well, uh, so we have this uh, inequality, but just write down what trace omega omega t positive means, and you get this inequality. And, uh, uh, <coughs> so this is a low bound, and uh, so we scale, uh, we scale ut by doing this. So take vt to be ut minus maximum ut minus one. We get a negative function uh, less than u minus one. This one is non-positive, and then uh, we, as a result, based on on the statement that I make, Laplacian of u is bigger than negative constant. Vt is less than u minus one. So I get this estimate that I wrote down earlier. And, uh, and then I get the convergence uh, in LQ to W. And, uh, <coughs> and VJ converges almost everywhere there. And then we apply the Schwartz inequality and find out this statement. Uh, and then integrate, uh, integrate this equation inequality, uh, integrate the left hand side equals 0. And integrate, you get this inequality. And this is good because the right hand side uh, is bound because k is strictly positive at one point. That's quasi, uh, quasi negative means uh, it's negative at one point, and that's all we care. K, k pi is less than equal to zero and positive one point, so this would be good. So this gives you an estimate on the maximum u, it cannot go to minus infinity. That, that to stop it to go to minus infinity. So as a result, we can prove that the, the, uh, the integral uh, c1 to the power m is, uh, uh, so this statement, integral c1m is positive. And that's good enough to prove the inequality that we need. So namely that if holomorphic curvature is quasi-negative, so, uh, uh, so, so non-positive and strongly positive one point, in price is ample. So the argument uh, is simple. The companion's argument that, that I, I wrote down earlier, you just compute this thing, and then you integrate by part, and you get this, uh, apply some hard inequality argument, you get that. But let me, let me not go into detail of that. So some simple analysis can, can do it. Um, so this argument, uh, I, I, Cheng and I did it in 1974. I must say I was somewhat embarrassed because this, was, this statement was cooked in my, in my Fields Medal citation, which totally embarrassed me. But I, I'm glad that I found some use of it. <coughs> now, complete k lines are met metric. Uh, so um, we can generalize the whole thing to complete non compact k -line manifold. Uh, the same thing, you prove that uh, exceeding k lines are metric with negative scalar curvature, and it's also equivalent to the, the, to the metric with 
we have holomorphism curve that bound above by negative constant. So this is more non-trivial because it's non-compact now. Uh, so we prove that if a complicated metric whose holomorphism curve is bound by two negative constants, then it emits a unique Kähler answer metric, uh, which is uniform equivalent this omega. And the curvature of this Kähler answer metric in all its coefficients are bound. Now, um, in a way, um, uh, this is rather surprising that it's true, uh, because all the covariant derivative of this metric is um, is bound. Now, existing k lines are metric on non-compact manifold was developed by by Cheng and myself, and in, uh, in a more general uh, situation, um, was due to Mo and myself, but. Um, the fact that this is true in this statement is really surprising to me. Um, here, when we have to uh, smooth out the, the manifold, uh, the metric. But anyway, the important part is that the holomorphic curvature is, is bound from below. Uh, the statement as it is, I, I think it's not true without, without the lower bar. Uh, we, uh, As it stays. But if we just assume it has an upper bar, I think k lines are metric should exist, except we don't know whether it's covariant theory is bound or not. It probably should not be true. Okay? So, holomorphic curvature can go to minus infinity in principle. So, this will tell you that uh, in the case when you have holomorphic curvature bound above and below, then the k lines are metric is actually better than what, I, what you deserve in a way. Um, uh, the current duties are also bound. So how does it work? Well, you try to work out in a similar argument uh, uh, using uh, Souder theory and all that. Uh, now, the Souder estimate requires injective radius of the complete manifold to be positive. Uh, but um, the manifold does not have bound injective radius. But this is uh, easy to over over overcome. And this, this is the kind of argument we devised uh, uh, 40 years ago with, uh, with Chang. Uh, so basically, uh, we cover the manifold uh, in the following way. As long as the curvature tensor is bounded, then there's a constant depending on the curvature such that for any point, the exponential map is an uh, inversion because the conjugate locus is uh, big if the curvature is bounded. And you just pull back the metric on the ball under the exponential map. Exponential, exponential map being an open immersion allows you to pull back the metric so that the Laplace is uniform elliptic on the ball. And this is all you need. All the estimates go back and work on, the, on this ball instead of working downstairs. So you apply the solder theory on the ball instead of on the manifold itself. So although in the manifold, everyone crunched down, closed down to, to where small, but you should work on the, on the tangent space, and then you're fine. So this is thing that I did with Cheng, and I think very few people pay attention to it. But anyway, so you, you do that, and then you can uh, uh, basically uh, work as if the manifold is in, uh, with uh, bound uh, geometry. Uh, but you have to... Uh, at the beginning, we work on uh, Riemannian metric, and in here you need to deal with holomorphic coordinate, and then we can make use of this uh, some simple argument that I did with you many years ago to find holomorphic coordinate. As, uh, by knowing the geodesic uh, coordinate as a d bar can be controlled in a suitable manner, d bar of the geodesic coordinate, and then from there you can solve the holomorphic functions with form. Uh, so in a small neighborhood. So you can use holomorphic coordinate in a small neighborhood. And that allows you to do basically everything that we want uh, holomorphic, uh, in holomorphic um, uh, geometry. So, um, so using this case, we call it crazy coordinate chart, uh, allowing side to be uh, not one-to-one, uh, -one, but just immersion. Uh, so this, using this, we can produce a holder space and everything works in the same way. And uh, now, we, what we do is that the background metric omega has bound curvature 
And we can assume that the bound character also has bound covalent derivative. This comes out from uh, uh, the rigid flow. The rigid flow uh, by C works out that once you have such a Kähler metric, you can deform it, still a Kähler metric, with, but now the, all the covalent derivative of this curvature tends to are bound. So we use that as a background metric. Okay. And uh, so once we start out from that, uh, complete Kähler metric, uniform equivalent omega, and curvature has bound. And uh, then we start, we use it as our base metric, and it still has negative pinch holomorphic central curvature and we use it as a background. And so it's important that we start out with something where all the covalent differentiation of the, cur of the curvature up to any order are bound. Okay? And then we can still do the same thing as I did earlier, and we can prove that um, everything works, and we obtain a k Einstein metric which is uniform equivalent to the original omega. And now, in particular, we prove that this k Einstein metric has bound covalent up to any order. <coughs> so uh, this unit is, uh, is uh, rather uh, straightforward to do using Schwarzheimer. So, um, so we have proved therefore this statement that um, you get a, um, a manifold uh, with well, k lines are metric. Here we generalize a little bit more. Uh, so um, if you take a uh, coupling, universal coupling of the manifold, if there exists a holomorphic map into manifold with strongly negative holomorphic sensor character, so that this holds, then you can also admit a complete Kähler-Einstein metric, which is uniform equivalent to omega. So this study is gen more general than, than uh, what I said earlier, because uh, the, the manifold itself may not have such a map, but the universal cover may. And so, um, Let's not, not go to this. Um, um, so this analysis, and let me let me not not uh, put, uh, put in too much work on this. So this, in any case, this kind of argument in particular implies that the Teichmann space has a k Einstein metric because uh, the universal cover of the Teichmann space by base embedding implies that it has a map from the covering space to a large ball in CN, so that proven metric is non-degenerate. So one can use this one to prove uh, the existence of k lines are metric on the Teichmann space. And this, of course, was known already. Uh, and in fact, uh, Sun and Kevin Liu and I studied this uh, pretty extensively. And we know more in more detail how the metric looks like there too. Um, now, um, let me see. Um, so let's look at some, some part on the um, uh, more, little bit more general uh, question. Um, so many years ago, uh, Robert Greene and Wu uh, asked the following question. If a complete simply connect Kähler manifold has sensor curvature bounded between two negative constants, then the Kobayashi rather metric is uniform equivalent to the background Kähler metric. Uh, of course, um, this one side of it is easy uh, by using the Schwarzheimer. Namely, the Kobayashi metric is bounded below by, the, by those with holomorphic sensor curvature negative. So it's the upper bound that one needs to address to. And this can be handled by the argument that we use here. Uh, so if a complete Kähler manifold holomorphic sensor curvature bound between two negative constants, then this metric, Kobayashi metric, is uniform equivalent to the background Kähler metric. Uh, <coughs> so so uh, we can prove it along the way that uh, we develop. And you can do the same thing for, uh, for the Bevan metric in a reasonable form also. Um, so, um, so let me go. Uh, um, let me let me not go into detail of that. Uh, <coughs> so let me just state the statement. Uh, <coughs> so if M is a complete simply connect Kähler manifold with a sensor curvature bound between two negative constants, then this Bevan metric has bounded geometry and satisfy the upper bound like this, and. Uh, <coughs> 
<coughs> and so that the Bevan matrix is uniformly equivalent to the, to the omega that you construct at the beginning. And um, so now, let me make a remark. Um, for a bound the domain, um, so improving the result that S Y Chang and two for holomorphic converse uh, bound the domain, Mock and I proved that it always exists a complete K-Lan symmetric. But those uh, K-Lan symmetric, I think uh, the curvature on the covariant derivative of curvature is probably not bounded. Uh, but <coughs> for those, according to what we proved here, if the, the, the domain itself admit, the one, admit one with bound holomorphism curvature above a negative and below by some negative constant, <coughs> then in fact it's bound. Now why do I say that? It's probably not true in general. Uh, in my work with Cheng, which is 40 years ago, um, we used the curvature, how they decay to negative constant near the boundary to control the regularity of the boundary, actually, of the, of the metric. And uh, there's no re so therefore, the k lines are metric being smooth, uh, the covariant duty to be bounded to very high order, so it gives some regularity of the boundary itself. Uh, so I believe, uh, therefore, um, there are some bounded domain, uh, holomorphic convex bounded domain, which do not admit uh, k lines metric, complete k lines metric, with holomorphic sessional curvature bounded above and below by negative constant. Uh, it would be nice to, to see that it's true or not true, but I believe it's not true. So that means it, it should exist such a boundary domain. But the boundary domain has bad boundary. Uh, uh, but on the other time, uh, domain is a pretty bad boundary domain, supposedly, and it does admit such a metric. So one has to be careful. Now, um, Tom is almost up, but let me um, mention at the very end, uh, even when I uh, prove uh, Kähler answer metric exists on a compact Kähler manifold in 1976, in 1977, I immediately worked on the, those uh, metrics with singularity and also complete Kähler answer metric. Uh, these are works with the, I did with Chang. And uh, for algebraic manifold, this corresponding to Canonical light bundle of the manifold plus a divisor to be strictly positive. That's a simple case uh, we, we discussed. This actually appeared in my Helsinki talk in 1978. For some reason, including my own student, does not know I published those papers in 1978. <laughs> and only after four or five years, many people reproduced those results. But, um, but in fact, this is a... a, a, a uh, Things that one should know, the argument for k lines are measured with negative scalar curvature is actually very general. Um, so th this is a, a, a uh, situation one can use. So take any complex variety with singularity possibly. Take a set S. S need not be a singular set of M. It could be just a sub-variety. And you, you look at the metric defined on the complement of it. So that at each point on this set S, there exists neighbor of it, so that there's a no, another non-singular manifold and sub-variety. So that I prove that the metric, I res uh, s prove that there's a map from O into this neighborhood U, so that I prove that the metric, it becomes a nice uh, sub uh, metric. So, so I prove that um, the map is locally invertible on the, on the complement so that the map is mapped to be a non-singular metric. So what's an uh, uh, example of such a, such a ca case? For example, I take an orbifold. An orbifold is a coson of a ball, uh, just a simple case. So orbifold has a metric um, which is a Euclidean metric on, on a ball. And it's invariant under the orthogonal group. So we go down to a metric which has singularity at the orbifold point. 
So this is one case of a metric, Kata metric, on the orbifold. When you pull back to the ball, it becomes non-singular, and in fact, you put a metric. So this is a typical case you can resolve singularity of a Kata metric on the orbifold metric. So I call it to be a Kata metric is set to admit resolution singularity if a system map exists at every point. Um, so as I said, an example, good example, is a case of orbifold. But this would be much more general than, than, than that, uh, than orbifold point, because the map could be quite uh, general. And uh, so I think if the curvature and the covariant due to the curvature of k metric is bound in such a neighborhood S, then such a resolution system should exist. So I call it a conjecture on resolution singularity of a k metric. Uh, <clears throat> now, such a holomorphic system exists then you can prove existence of a complicated isometric with negative Ricci curvature um, um, in a very general setting. Because um, the existence of a isometric is more or less reduced to a local problem. Um, the local problem is powerful enough that it can be used to settle um, many problems in algebraic geometry. You will know how to do the local resolution uh, carefully. So an important case is the, the case, uh, uh, the terminal singularity. What kind of uh, K-Lan symmetric can you put locally near the terminal singularity? Now, the K-Lan symmetric exists and is unique if you know, um, if you control the singularity in a suitable way. But uh, this kind of resolute singularity may be more complicated than that. So, um, so you could have a singular point S, so that in the neighborhood there, the Kata answer metric may blow up in one direction and degenerate in other direction. Uh, this would be allowed. And those create uh, some non uniqueness problem for Kata answer metric. So how the metric looks like near a singular point is actually a very important question. And I believe this should be <coughs> addressed too. And this would be very useful for understanding for many of our general time. Uh, because uh, it's not hard at all to prove existence of Kata answer metric on such a thing. The problem is how it looks like, uh, how the metric singularity looks like. So that you can compute uh, the um, uh, connections near there, so that you can compute the train classes and all that kind of important quantities that will be adapt to the resolution singularity relate to the, the algebraic geometry. If that is the case, I think there are a lot of things you can apply uh, uh, Kata metric to those, those manifolds. So I think I'll stop here, and congratulations on your birthday again, Sam Pierre.